I want to make sure the camera's Hey, cops, are you, you get the audio? Can you pull that uh, that white cord? Yeah. You just hear Mike check them all three. Check, test, one, two, one, two. Check, check. Check, one, two. <laughs> <laughs> um, once I get the clear from Dennis that we're all recording. You all good? Yep. You all good, John? We're good. All right, we're good. Uh, cool. Well, uh, for people that are joining us on camera, Chris McKay, director, Dan Lin, producer, uh, thank you both so much for being here and for doing the Q&A. Yeah, thank you. Uh, let me start by saying a huge thank you to Warner Brothers and IMAX for letting us do this event, showing it before it's in theaters. Um, I believe the last Lego movie was not in IMAX. No. Uh, so no. this is the first Lego movie in IMAX. So yeah. Let's talk about that. It's a big issue for us. <laughs> it is, actually. Is, is it controversial? It is with me and Greg Foster, you know, because um, I think IMAX, and he said I could say this, he said that uh, they didn't know what the first Lego movie was going to be about and what exactly we were going for. And then so when it came out, he regretted that he didn't uh, release it in IMAX. Yeah, they don't do a lot of animated movies. So. Yeah, yeah, so, you know, for us, it was about this is not a kid's movie. They don't do kid's movies. They just do broad, broad, appealing movies. And he thought this was, you know, we showed him the movie early and he thought it was cooler, hipper than a typical animated movie, so he allowed us to do an IMAX. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm very happy because if it wasn't an IMAX, we would not be doing this screening. <laughs> you know? So, uh, um, by the way, I'm going to open this up for questions from the audience in a little bit. Um, but let me start with the, the, the basic, which is where did this come from in terms of was this the plan before Lego Movie was in development? Was it always thinking about Lego Batman Movie? Or was it after the success? Where, where did it happen? I think it happened the night that the movie opened or the weekend the movie opened. Um, uh, I think you yeah, you had a conversation with Greg Silverman. Yeah, it, uh, it was actually Vito's restaurant in uh, Santa Monica, and we're all there. We had a like a, uh, kind of a key crew and cast uh, dinner, like celebrating the movie, and we didn't know how well it, it would do. And then I remember Dan Feldman coming in and telling us the numbers on Friday night, and they're you know they're, they're very they were very uh, big at the time, and uh, we were already talking about doing uh, a Lego Batman movie, and then literally Greg Silverman, the president of Warner Brothers, told Will Arnett at that party. <laughs> Will was just thrilled that uh, he was the next one up. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seemed like a natural fit. This is the one side character that you can do a story about. He's got a very clear, uh, very clear second act. Uh, well, I'm always curious about the development process with with animation because things can sometimes radically change. So, from when you envisioned this to what people just saw tonight, how much changed along the way? Compared to a lot of animated movies, especially. Uh, um, well, in any animated movie, we uh, we did this basically in about two and a half years. So from no script, from like a treatment to finished movie, and I, I finished animating this movie in December. So um, we turned this thing around really fast. Uh, most animated movies take four years, five years. You know, Pixar they can do eight years. Um, so to so as far as the change goes, I mean, I was. Um, Working with the storyboard team and the editors and the writer, I was kind of even before the script landed. I was, I was we did the lobster thermidor microwave scene and all of that stuff. We did the big opening because I, I I knew that you know we wanted the opening of this movie to be the third act of somebody else's Batman movie. You know, so you really <laughs> felt like there was this big crazy you know James Bond style opening to the movie, and then um, and then. After this kind of slam bang thing with music and, and, and songs and, and all, hopefully all of the universe uh, of the Batman Brooks Gallery and you got introduced to Gotham City and the conflict between Batman and Joker, you just watch Batman go home and and, and like microwave <laughs> play, play with you know and not have set up his HDMI so it has labels so he knows you know like all the things that people do and um, and you know you get mail. And, um, I was just hoping that people would like you know kind of respond to that. So you you want to follow Batman because you saw how lonely and how you know incomplete his life was. So the story actually changed a lot over the course of development, but what didn't change was McKay's initial pitch, which was Michael Mann meets a Michael Mann action movie meets about a boy, and <laughs> so like, what does that mean? And so he really you know the first ten minutes of the movie really didn't change a whole lot. He did that pretty early on. Um, through animatics and uh, previs, so we got a sense of kind of the tone that he was going for. And other things didn't change. Specifically, uh, we kept talking, and, and Chris and I, and, and uh, Seth Graham Smith, the original writer, and Phil Lord and Chris Miller talked about what's the central theme we're trying to explore in this movie, and that didn't change, which is, why isn't Batman happy? Yeah. You know, he's a guy who you would think that has everything in the world, from money 
to fame, to great vehicles, to great abs, to great abs. <laughs> yeah, great abs. Um, but why is he, that. when he goes home, he's not happy? That, that's the central theme of this film. Uh, I'm always curious. Uh, the, the first movie uh, came out of left field. It was a huge hit that no one really saw coming. Uh, this one obviously is on the roadmap, if you will, for the studio. You guys are making other Lego movies. Uh, what was it like in terms of like, were there a lot more hands in the kitchen wanting to sort of finagle this meal? Or was it sort of hands off because you guys did such a great job in the first one? Yeah, why didn't we set that bar a little bit lower? <laughs> uh, that's, what, that's, what, that's what was going through my head the entire time. Is couldn't we have just maybe like you know, screwed up a little bit more in the first movie? Um, uh, yeah, it was, it was, it's hard to follow, you know, a movie that, that, that audiences really love and, and that does, you know, well at the box office and, and that, that critics like and that kind of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, with, with success, you invite a lot of other people into the process and, um, uh, uh, and I think everybody, um, in, in, you know, which I think is a good thing actually because um, we're doing this like so fast that you kind of need sometimes you need a lot of people backstopping you and, and giving you um, you know good feedback and opinion. Well, that actually opens the door on what I wanted to follow up on, which is uh, who did you guys show the movie to early in the process, like friends and family that you trusted for honest feedback, and maybe what did you learn from those early screenings? Dan's son Miles. <laughs> we showed it to him. He's only half joking. We really do show our friends and family because uh, at a certain point with animation, it's just really rough until you get some finished animation. So we don't like to show it too much outside to the public. We can't properly test it, but we do show our, our families. Um, obviously, we have our core group of filmmaker friends at Bricksburg uh, where we make these movies in Hollywood. We have a bunch of filmmakers, uh, writers, directors, uh, producers that we show it to. Show it to the WAG guys. A bunch of WAG principals that we show it to, and then certainly Chris is your his go-to collaborators as well. That he used to work with. So it's kind of our bigger kind of network in our community that we show it to before we go out and test it to the world. And we work with Lindsay, Lindsay Duran, um, who's amazing. She's the script whisperer of, of Hollywood. She's, she's fantastic. And then, um, you know, for us and while we were, while we were developing the movie, um, we did a couple of writer jams where we got some really funny people together. Some people ended up doing voices in the movie, like Jason Manzoukas and and people like that um, who are really funny and just kind of showing it to them and kind of working through some of the story stuff with them, which was which was a lot of fun. And you know, you get to laugh a lot, but you get a lot of work done, which is which is great. But Steve, you asked, you know, how many people are involved? You know, McKay as a director always respect. He gets so many notes on these movies because we we tend to like to show it to people internally in our family. But his job as a director is ultimately he's hearing lots of notes from me, Lord and Miller, Lindsay Duran. Then he's got to go away and process and which ones does he agree with and which ones does he tell us to to go away on, so that's the challenge. Uh, one of the things that's really cool about this movie are the villains. I mean, it's literally, it's a who's who of the Batman verse, and uh, and then a lot of other IPs that you guys managed to bring in. Uh, was it tricky getting these other IPs, and were there any that you went after that you couldn't? You know, I, uh, as far as the rogues gallery, I mean, I wanted to try to get everybody in. I wanted to, I, I, my dream was to have like, Flamingo and Professor Pig and like, you know, yeah. like you know, literally everybody uh, that you could get your hands on, um, and that was that was just sort of cost prohibitive from the standpoint of just making those characters, you know, on screen, rigging them, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so and, and also like things like Flamingo are, are uh, their backstories are kind of dark, and and so Lego kind of only let me like have like mutant leader and. Like you know, stuff like that because they're you know because they wouldn't let me sort of like put people in there who like you know did a lot of murdering I guess. Yeah. Um, it's kind of valid. I'll, I'll give them that. Yeah, I mean, look, they're not wrong. I'm not. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm saying that's this what happened. Um, it was easier than the first one. First one, people didn't know what to expect. This time around, we went to different rights holders. They got what we were going for. Uh, not everyone agreed, but I think the big pitch for us is that Lego Batman. This is a way for a child to enter the world of superheroes. So like my son Hudson's only eight years old. He's never seen Batman versus Superman or Dark Knight until he gets older. But this is his way to this is his first Batman movie. And so for other kids, this might be their first way they see Harry Potter or Lord of the Rings. You know, the Matrix, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's a gateway drug <laughs> to, to uh, you know, to let them into these worlds and be curious about it. Same way that when I saw stuff that Spielberg and Lucas were doing and that led me to John Ford or Edgar Bruce or Martin Scorsese or something else like 
you know, there's references in there that they might find their way to maybe serendipity, who knows? <laughs> Anything can happen. Um, but, but, you know, there were like, you know, I think everybody wanted us, like the people we approached, you know, for like Dalit or, um, you know, um, you know, J.K. Rowling for Voldemort, they, they let us do it partly because of the relationship in the Lego movie, but also, you know, we had, we were asking for more this time too because they played a bigger part than some of these cameos in the, in the Lego movie that they're actually part of the plot as opposed to just like a side joke. Well, what, one of the things that's great about this is that unlike the live action films, you can pretty much break any rule there is in the Batman universe and just go with it and the audience is gonna go along for the ride. Uh, was there anything that you were just like, uh, any joke or any sort of thing you wanted to put in that you know, as a Batman fan, you had to put in the film? Um, well, I, you know, let's get nuts, stuff like that. Like <laughs> lines, <laughs> lines, lines from the movie or, or uh, allusions to parts of the movie. Uh, to parts shark repellent. Shark repellent. Um, uh, atomic batteries to power, turbines to speed. Um, you know, all of those kinds of things, references to the two boats and uh, uh, stuff like that. Like, you know, I, that was all what I really wanted, you know, wanted to do the Neil Hefty score, things like that. Lauren Balfe, who did the score for the movie, actually worked on all of the Hans Zimmer Dark Knight scores, because he's one of Hans Zimmer's guys, and actually produced the Dark Knight and Dark Knight Rises albums. Um, and he's a, a fantastic composer, and kind of came, and came in and did something that sounds a little bit like Danny Elfman, sounds a little bit like um, the Hans Zimmer thing, but also is its own thing. And then he's a big Jerry Goldsmith fan, so he started doing these like boys adventure themes and I gave him like the badly drawn boy stuff from about a boy and he kind of found ways of kind of incorporating some of those ideas. Uh, we brought in Chad Smith um, to do drums. So he does drums on the song. Ch Chad Smith and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. He does drums on the songs, but he also does drums on the actual score because I wanted it to feel like there was like a, like a rock band, you know, like because Batman fancies himself to be like a, you know, a, a music artist. Um, so I wanted to, the whole movie to feel like that. It could all look like that. Uh, Dan, I have to address the fact that uh, you're running point on all these Lego movies. Uh, we talked earlier today, it's sort of like uh, you have the, almost the Kevin Feige position uh, on you know, the Lego films. And I know that uh, Ninjago, they just released some images today, and that's coming up, and you have the Lego movie sequel. I know people want to know about the other Lego movies, so what can you tease people? Yeah, first of all, I don't feel like I'm Kevin Feige at all. <laughs> what? I feel like I'm like he started, he literally started this whole thing. No, I, I, like, I mean, he, like he, yeah. you know, eight years ago, he's the guy that, that came up with this idea and, and, and approached Chris and Phil. Like, he's the one who thought that this, you could do something in this, in this like idiom, you know, so. I feel like I'm, it's more like a first for his inmates running an asylum and I'm like the key <laughs> inmate. Um, <laughs> but I think that's a, it's a key thing for us, which is kind of how we're trying to build out these movies in that Lego Batman, as you guys can see, it's not a sequel to the first movie. You know, we want to very much approach each genre with our kind of Lego approach. So the first one is our adventure movie. This one is our superhero action movie. The next one's gonna be our version of a kung fu martial arts movie. And then with giant we'll, robots and giant and yeah. Godzilla, kaiju stuff. So we're just going crazy with kind of our kid fantasies and then we're gonna to build to the sequel. And so for us, the challenge is constantly making sure we're, we're keep our key tenets of these movies, which is our very specific, I would say subversive of reference, sense of humor, uh, our sense of joy in these movies, and then constantly pushing the visual look, because we want these movies to look different than any other animated movie out there, which is why we love seeing the IMAX. You know, I think this is a great in-between, between a 3D movie and a 2D movie, because you still get that, that dimension, because ultimately you want these movies to feel like it's a kid's toy set coming to life. Totally. I, uh, I thought it looked uh, great tonight. It sounds like a plug, but it's legit. Yeah. You know, it, looked, it looked fantastic. It looked really great. You know, um, so I, I'm going to do one uh, follow-up for you, and then I'm going to open it up for people in the audience, which is, uh, assuming this is a hit, uh, do you envision continuing in like the superhero Lego kind of thing? Or, you know, I mean, like, talk a little bit about what your interests are. Well, I mean, I, you know, the uh, we, we sort of cast this because we were hoping that maybe we'd do more kinds of movies like this or within this world so you could do it you know, a Joker's rogues gallery suicide squad movie or something like that, and, you know, just- I, I did catch that one joke just, that, uh, <laughs> that was quite good. I didn't, was there a suicide squad joke? <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, or, you know, like, or you could do Justice League, or, uh, you know, I really love the, you know, Batgirl and Robin character, so you do stuff like that with them. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I hope that we get to do more stuff in this, in this world, because it's a lot of fun. I really love these actors and this crew, it's really great. Uh, 
Uh, cool, let's open it up to some, does anyone have any questions? Uh, right there. Well, we kind of started this thing before the Lego Dimensions thing, you know, like before I even knew what Lego Dimensions yeah. was. Um, so fortunately, they did some of the, you know, they, there are some of those characters are in some of those packs. Like but they recognized Wicked Witch of the West yeah. and Gremlins from Lego Dimensions packs. Yeah, yeah. But we also like, you know, it, so it's one of these things where it's kind of like we're both sort of developing something at the same time. But. Right. Um, but fortunately, they did all that design work for us. <laughs> <laughs> so it helped out a lot. Because <laughs> the work was done. Oh, another uh, right there. Yeah, so the, I, I really enjoy how these movies, they're designed to look like this a, a kid with like a, a you know, $200 million budget made in like stop motion <laughs> yeah. film. So, but like, and obviously, like, um, you, put the, you push some of the boundary, boundaries, like the characters. In certain, in, in different ways that are not like you know that you can't do with a Lego figure. How do you know like wh where, where do you set like the line for like realism? Because these movies have like a wonderful realistic look to them, which is so makes them so visually appealing. Even though you know they're just Legos, you know. Yeah. So how where's where's, where's, where's the line? You know. In, in, um, I, I started movie. in stop motion animation, um, and, the, and the way that we, you know, when, when Chris and Phil asked me to be a part of, and Dan asked me to be a part of these movies. Um, it was sort of my job to kind of help figure that, figure out some of that stuff, and, and we'd always said that we wanted to make uh, these movies uh, look like 11-year-old um, Henry Selick and 11-year-old Michael Bay uh, lived on <laughs> lived on the same street, and they wanted they wanted to make movies together, and so somehow they collaborated, and and made uh, crazy uh, Lego brick films, um, and, but I, I think for us. You know, I, I don't do anything, or we don't try to do anything that doesn't that you couldn't actually do with a Lego minifig. So when you we're not actually when it looks like we're bending stuff, it actually we're not what what we're end up what, what I end up uh, the animators end up doing is they crash a lot of stuff. They'll crash it into the body in a way. So if like your camera, you know, they'll crash something into the body that to you you can't see, or it's over here, so it crosses over in order to be able to grab something, and you can't see that it's crashing over here but it, technically it's crashing but we're just sort of like we're treating like I would do or any animators I worked with in stop motion would do where you just you just take a limb off and you use a little bit of like sticky wax or whatever and you stick it to the to the side of the body so it just sort of or you shave it down a little bit so you can get that kind of feeling but the only the only thing the only real cheat that we do is crash everything else actually is stuff that you could do in stop motion and again even when you're crashing it you just like shave the neck down or do something in order to get that feeling and then just have replacement heads that you just end up like a shaved one to be able to do this, do that expression, that kind of thing. So it's it's still by principles or 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 like, you know, when Joker's doing like tree pose and stuff like that in the yard, like it's, it, we're just, you know, just using other bricks and slamming other bricks in there, taking the leg out, putting another brick in there, a wedge piece or whatever, in order for it to look or feel like that, but it's, but they're, they're real cheats that you do in stop motion, but they're not cheats as in like we're squashing and stretching anything and all the animators. So, and I actually brought animators from Robot Chicken and some of the other stuff that I worked on um, who knew a, a little bit about CG and they kind of learned on the job. And so they, um, and, I, and I asked people to never sort of interpret it with the computers. That, you know, I want it to feel as handmade as possible. So instead of going from point to point, um, they're making decisions on every frame or every two frames because sometimes you do some stuff on twos just to give it that extra sort of feeling. But um, but yeah, they're never inter they're they're interpreting themselves uh, along this whatever the movement is from you know point A to point B, and not allowing the computer to to do the interpretation. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Thank you. We also set a constraint for ourselves to use pre-existing pieces. So for every movie, there's only a handful of new pieces that are created for the movie. So it's an enhanced version of a program called Lego Digital Designer where you can actually design the whole movie. Yeah, and the, and the thing is we don't even actually make pieces that actually help us, because like for instance, like I just wanted Batman to have like a molded plastic belt because I thought it looked cool, yeah. because I thought it was like, oh, let's make him look more three-dimensional, so instead of having the sticker belt on him, I was just like, it's like let's have a molded plastic belt because I thought it looked cool. 
Um, but that actually doesn't help us in animation. <laughs> it just looked neat. Did you take that home? <laughs> I, you know, I was very proud when like the very first, uh, you know, because a lot of, um, you know, when the teasers come out or the trailers come out, a lot of kids sort of like take it apart, especially people who are real Lego fans. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that they singled out that, you know, because everyone was like, you know, all the people at Lego were fighting. He's like, why do you want to give Alfred this, this collar? There's no one, there's like a, there's not a part that anybody wants to use. <laughs> but when people like saw it and they thought, I, I love like details like that. Like I love like clothing details and stuff like that because I just, that's, when I was a kid, when you had like G.I. Joe's, they had all these like cool, sure. like, you know, weapons and accessories and, and Star Wars <coughs> characters. And that's what I liked about, you know, toys. So I just wanted, I wanted our characters to kind of have some of that stuff. So I just end up giving like Alfred a collar and <coughs> Batman a, a stupid belt. <laughs> uh, let's do another question. Right here in the front. Well, we're gonna wait for the microphone, if you don't mind. Right there. <clears throat> what was your thinking behind all the interactions with the different characters, like Batman and Joker's interactions? Like, like uh, you know that one scene where Joker was like, I hate you too, the Batman. <laughs> uh, and Batman said before, I hate you. Like, what were what was the thinking process behind all those interactions? Um, well, uh, they that's that is a that's a good question. <laughs> um, that might be something where, like, if you'd been in a relationship and you didn't tell somebody that you love them, um, <laughs> but they really wanted to define the relationship <laughs> that you were in, um, and they were really, they really wanted some, they wanted, they wanted, you know, to kind of know what your relationship status was, um, and that was sort of, that was a, <laughs> there was sort of a. Uh, an analog for that kind of relationship. So that's that's uh, that's kind of what was going on there. Is that he he he, he wanted to know what their status was. You, that was a very good answer. Yeah. <laughs> was. I, 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 thank you. I'm try, I'm, I'm, yes, I'm also trying not to swear because I know we have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of kids here. So uh, let's go to this side if you don't mind uh, and ask a question. I guess right there. That was a great question. Thank you. <laughs> What movie property? Yeah, and characters and anything you want to turn it together. Um, you know, that, that's a good question. Um, the Wire. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Yeah! I mean, I think that would be, I mean, honestly, I, do think, I think that would be really funny. <laughs> um, because I think, we, I think, I think part of what makes, you know, it's, it's hard because we, we have so many jokes that we had to cut and so many, observations or whatever about these kinds of movies they have to cut one of the things that I really like that makes me laugh and it might may not make everybody laugh and you sort of maybe can't make out the wire but there's something really funny about just giving these guys like because I, I really like giving these guys like really any of those side characters like really Michael Bay kind of like lines like things you'd say like the stuff you'd see in a trailer where somebody turns to the camera and says oh my god at some at some glowing light off camera and that kind of thing so the idea of like having them say like stuff that's in the wire, you know, uh, <laughs> it would just would, would just be. I just think you could literally do it script like just take the scripts for every single season, you know, you like the you know the the, the guys in the in the truck or in the docks. You can even do you know you do all that just literally do it you know verbatim and I think it would be hilarious. <laughs> just, just because it's in Lego and you shoot it really seriously, you know. <laughs> that makes me laugh. I, I, I want to ask actually, is there any uh, talk about doing any like short films of Lego? You know, like some of uh, Pixar and Disney will do those shorter films yeah. before the future. Yeah. Uh, is that something that like? Yeah, yeah. we did one and uh, put in front of stores called The Master. Um, but honestly, we're so busy making these Lego movies that it's hard because uh, we have just so many of them about to come out that it's hard to fit a short in there. Um, but we did The Master with this director John Saunders, who we're developing. He's really talented. So when we have time, we'll do a short, but right now we're just busy focusing on, you know, we have Lego Ninjago and Lego Movie 2 in production, and then we have another one that we're uh, in deep, or in, we're in development on, so it's kind of, we've got a lot going on, so a short is tough to squeeze in. Your face too. Yes. <laughs> uh, let's go another, whoever you want to get the mic to. Uh, given your uh, 
experience in traditional um, stop motion animation, because the visuals of this are incredible. How long would you estimate it would take to really do a, an entirely handmade version of this kind of movie? Um, that's a, yeah, that's a really great question. Uh, uh, if you had an infinite amount of money, <laughs> um, you and the, the hardest, one of the biggest things is the build. Uh, it, that's you know in stop motion. That's that's the you know one of the reasons why I became you know a director and producer of Robot Chicken is because you have to kind of play a, a, a chess game with the amount of sets that you have. So uh, and the amount of animators, the amount of people who can light stuff, and how you turn that thing around. And so that was you know one of the you know things that that's that's one of the hardest things about about working in, in stop motion. And so. To be able to build all of that stuff and to be able to run all of those different animate all those different animation stages with animators and then turn them around and be able to flip them, uh, that it, it's it would take in, uh, it would take not only years but also years off your life <laughs> to do. Entirely different. What do you think yeah. about the first yeah. movie in the live action set that we had in Will Ferrell's basement? I mean, that took us three months for a bunch of master builders to build. And then look at this scale. For a, yeah, for a yeah. two day, two and a half day shoot. That's right. Yeah. I was almost waiting for that idea. <laughs> I was so mad for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's let's try to right over here. Hey guys, cool. that movie's fantastic. I really like it a lot. Uh, first, I want to mention uh, that Batman and IMAX are the two properties that have really pushed me into being a film editor. Uh, I remember sitting in the theater watching. Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, yeah. like starting with the Dark Knight, but that's why I wanted to ask you guys, what does it mean to be a part of the Batman legacy now, and with the one superhero that started the mainstream Hollywood live action blockbuster in IMAX, because eventually you guys are going to have that poster next to the Nolan posters and all the future posters, so what does that mean to you guys? Well, it means a lot, because I, honestly, like, when we, when, I, when we were first developing that opening sequence, I wanted to do the same I mean, the I, logos are exactly Dark Knight Rises. Logos. Uh, well, I wanted yeah. to do. I wanted to do the whole. Well, I, yeah, that literally pulled that off the off the Blu-ray. Yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's basically the same. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how we got away with that either. This is being taped. Great. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's going right to Christopher Nolan's house. <laughs> right. Um, uh, sort of. We showed some scenes that Emma is producing partner. But yeah, I wanted. I thought that I, I wanted to do something with IMAX. I mean, I wanted to do something with IMAX when we was work, I was working on Chris and Phil in the first movie. But for this one, because we were doing this big kind of opening, and that you know, I like you, I went to go see the Dark Knight okay. IMAX thing when it was just when it was the teaser. It's the same thing they do with yeah. Dunkirk in the front of you know Rogue One and, and for Dark Knight Rises and that kind of thing. So I'm I'm that guy. But uh, but but yeah, I wanted to do that. But it was I think it was it wasn't until really we showed the movie that we got any you know traction with IMAX, like Dan said. So, um, but I always thought that this movie was sort of meant like we should have done that kind of promotion yeah. with this movie because I thought that would have been Batman's the one that started. It. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Thank For you. me, it's a weird, weird journey because it started in two thousand eight. I was producing Justice League yeah. with George Miller directing, yeah. and oh, the studio was shut down. Yeah. And so I suddenly had no movie to produce. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, the Lego movie actually came out of that because I was developing my next slate of projects. And then I kind of believe everything happens for a reason. Ironically, now I'm making the Lego version of a DC movie and then <laughs> Lego Justice League. Uh, yeah. So it's funny how things turn out. Yeah, one thing I want to add is like you mentioned the score before. The Bone Box score is fantastic. I've listened to it on loop like three times. Oh, cool. Uh, I picked up all the Zimmer stuff. Like there's very yeah. some subtle hints, but you're like, oh, that's the score when it plays during the boat scene. Oh, that's the Joker's kind of right yeah. tension thing. Yeah, yeah. And he's really bringing cool. all, and he brought instrumentation from that as well as from the Elfman yeah, thing to try to it. find. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's my, he's literally amazing. You give him a note, you know, not a, a note, uh, not a musical note, but just a director note, and he will change it for you right there in front of you on his keyboard. Uh, I, I've never worked with somebody who's, I mean, he's he's fantastic yeah. uh, as, a, as a collaborator and just knows everything about music. Yeah, and he tweeted him and he's like, listen again, you might find some nice stuff. <laughs> 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 Did you see they put the bat symbol yeah. in? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's, it's yeah. ridiculous. Um, where do you want to wanna go? We'll head back over to this side next. So I was just wondering, like, uh, a lot of the references that aren't in the script, like the, the Batman Beyond outfit or like the Dark Knight uh, Returns Superman attacks Batman at the beginning. Yeah. When did those like enter the movie and, and did you guys have 
that was right away. I mean, that's what that's what we wanted to do. We wanted. I mean, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a Batman fan, and I grew up, you know, loving Batman, and you know, read all or read, read everything I could get my hands on. And, um, so I, you know, I think that's really what it started. Adding things like you know, let's get nuts and, and that, that <laughs> stuff to the movie. Like all of that stuff was that was what made me want to do this thing. So yeah, being able to put mutant leader that was like. <laughs> That was like the first, you know, that was literally one of some of the first meetings that we had was how many of these people can we get in? Can we get Crazy Quilt in this movie or something <laughs> like that? So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's from the beginning. That was, that, those are the choices we were making. And then, you know, the art department got really nerdy about it and started grabbing all of that stuff for all of the background things. And it just, you know, it, I mean, it just turned into a love fest for Batman. And we were doing all this research, all the different bat caves, and, you know, because they have so many different you know, cutouts. I mean, just even the, in, you know, the, all the encyclopedias that DC put out about, you know, Batman over the years with all the cutouts of the different Bat caves. And, you know, so for us, it was just like, it was just trying to put as much Batman in the movie. You know, we, we made Gotham City look a little bit like Chicago, a little <laughs> bit because of the Christopher Nolan thing, a little bit like the Anton First stuff, and threw in a giant statue for Joel Schumacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, let's go to this side. Uh, roster of like celebrity like voices in this one yeah uh so my question is like you know you guys went from like Derek Arts to like Mariah Carey were people like what you have like announced for like <coughs> when I knew you were doing Venom were people calling you and saying like hey can I be in this movie some of it I mean yeah some of the some of it was people who were like sort of incoming calls that people you know gave us I mean some of it was also us kind of like searching people out I mean people you know liked the first Lego movie or, or like Lego or wanted to do something, you know, a kid's movie, that kind of thing. I think for Mariah Carey, you know, we were trying to find a, a Barbara Gordon and she wanted to, she wanted to, to be Batgirl and I don't think her voice was right for Batgirl. In the same way with Zoe Kravitz, I mean, you know, I think we searched, we, you know, we were kind of asked her, but her voice, she sounds so young. Like she could play, like she could do like little kid voiceover for the rest of her life. Um, yeah, she's got a great, by the way, uh, not, we didn't able to, weren't even able to use her enough because she's got a really great, really great voice uh, for animation. Um, and it's super fun and funny. But yeah, Mariah Carey uh, just wanted to do something and she's, 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 besides obviously her singing voice is amazing, she's got a really great kind of like New York voice. And I just love the sound of it, and it just she just sounded like a mayor. You sound like a hard ass, and so, you know, like. Um, right here for mayor. Yeah, I mean, I, look, <laughs> you know, the, the the city would sparkle. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. I mean, literally, she came. She was super playful. And like she did the pew pews, and, and like she went crazy with no more crime. And obviously she was sort of channeling Oprah for the for the you know uh, South American uh, South African jungle safari. Like she, I mean she was. Uh, I could you know, again I can't say enough good things about working with her because she was. I mean everybody that I worked with on this movie was fun, but she was like I didn't know what to expect you know. But she yeah. was just like she was fun and. And like I said, game to play, doing any of the stupid things I asked her to do. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I couldn't be luckier. Uh, I love the soundtrack. I really love the soundtrack. It was like 80s greatest hits Pandora. <laughs> I, it was, I, it was fun. Um, I just wanted to, uh, two questions. Is Man in the Mirror your favorite Michael Jackson song? Or is it just happy coincidence? It works perfectly with the story. And uh, how much of that soundtrack was that, of the 80s soundtrack? Um, I, well, I'm a big Michael Jackson fan for sure. I think uh, in most, I think probably most people are, or, or, or are in general anyway, um, uh, musically. Um, <laughs> this thing's being taped. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I want to start the movie with a with a quote because I thought all important movies uh, start, with, start with a quote. And usually, it's like some Nietzsche thing or something like that, you know, uh, for movies like this. But um, uh, we we hit on the the you know the the man in the mirror quote because it's obviously about change and it made a lot of sense. And then um, you know, sort of a la um, uh, Robert Altman's uh, Long Goodbye, where a song just sort of appears. 
throughout the entire movie. The same song kind of appears in different ways. I kind of wanted Man in the Mirror to show up. So there's, you know, obviously the Richard Cheese, the lounge singer, is <laughs> singing it. And there's other parts of the movie that kind of add the theme in it. And, and you know, we asked uh, Glenn Ballard, who, who wrote the song, to come in and, and produce a new version of the song. And so, so he did. Uh, uh, yeah, so working really closely with the music department, um, we were able to kind of like use that song and kind of have it have a, a life in the movie. And it just goes, it, it meant a lot to us the more we kind of like found ways of using it. Well, we're waiting for the next one. So is the plan then for a Lego movie every year? Or is, what, what is the, the release schedule that you guys have? No, right now the current plan is going to be Ninjago coming out this fall. And that's with Jackie Chan and Justin Thoreau. And so Jackie is, um, I don't know if you guys have seen this video that's going around, he has a stunt team called the JC Stunt Team. And this video is going around that he is, uh, they, they do, do a tribute to him. Um, but what we've done is we've hired Jackie Chan and the JC Stunt Team to do the action in the movie. So they were actually performing the action in, um, you know, in live action, then we film it, and then we convert it into animation. You're, the uh, animators wrote a scope, the, the action. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah, it's gonna be really cool. It's gonna be really cool. And Chris is producing the movie with me, and so we're really excited to do that. So, with every Lego, we want to try something new and push the boundaries and bring something fresh to the art form. Well, but so getting back, is the plan for one a year, or so it's not exactly one a year right now. We have Ninjago coming out this fall, and then we have Lego Movie sequel coming out in February of nineteen. That's the current schedule. Got it. So I would imagine that there's a possibility of a Christmas. 19 movie that just hasn't been announced yet. I hope the next one won't be until at least 2020, so Chris and I have a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's do another question right here. Hello. So you guys get quite a few good digs in at the most recent DC movies. Mm. Has anyone that has worked on those movies seen that yet? And uh, <laughs> what was their reaction to it if they did? Well, I mean, I think probably the the only thing that really qualifies as a as a, as a dig is the Suicide Squad <laughs> thing. Like that that sort of qualifies. I think everything. I mean, and and again, it's sort of just Batman's point of view because obviously Batman comes around at the end of the movie and literally does like the exa he literally does the Suicide Squad thing where he yeah. brings the criminals in and helps out. So it's it's we're sort of having our cake and eating it too. I mean, I, again, I think to me they're, they're they're it's all with love because. I mean, I'm the I'm the first guy in line to see all of these movies, yeah. so um, you know, and I and I you know I, I I care about these characters. I like these characters. and I like these movies, but yeah, I mean, I think you know we I don't know if you noticed, but we sort of had a shout out to, to Zack Snyder yeah. and the Chiron for the news footage, you yeah. know, the stuff that's sort of the Man of Steel thing. Um, well, we showed him that scene. We showed him, yeah, you know, <laughs> and his wife Deb, and, yeah. and even the Nolan scenes. We showed Emma Thomas, uh, Chris Nolan's uh, producing partner and wife. So. It's not like we just snuck this behind them. We really just <laughs> and wanted to show them what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, originally I wanted to use footage, and at one at one point we actually had we got the Batman versus Superman footage to put in the movie for some of that stuff. So they're so I mean, you know, they were willing to work with us. We decided to do some of it in Lego because we couldn't get all of the footage, so we just ended up um, we just ended up doing it in Lego. And so uh, except for the. <laughs> that would have been, been crazy. I didn't know that you might have thought about live action. Yeah, well, the original okay. version of that was all was all live action. So, hey, uh, you can say we can come down here, or actually, maybe you can say the question. And I can just repeat. Sure, uh, Batman is sort of a. There we go. Batman is an edgier character. So, were there any bits or gags that you were sort of overruled on for the movie as being? Not PG-13. Mm. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Did you do the alt ending when that you did about how Batman, the whole Mayor McCaskill switchover? Yeah, although that they we're going to try to put that in the DVD and the Blu-ray. <laughs> <the Blu -ray. laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there was stuff where he tried to push the envelope. I mean, there's, there's stuff about how hard Batman um, uh, fought against them as a family. So there was a moment where... Um, uh, Batman was trying to get them to leave the, the moment where he puts them in the scuttler and sends them away and I had a, and I had a bit in there where he says you're a cop you're a butler and you're an orphan and that I think was it was it was devastating and it definitely was hard you know it was like hardcore um, but uh, and I, it was very emotional but uh, that was something I think that pushed 
a lot of people's buttons. Unfortunately, the very first screening we had was a friends and family screening where there was somebody in the audience who was a, oh, no. adopted from an orphanage. <laughs> so, you know, cast your audience for your friends and family screening, <laughs> especially when Lego executives are there. <laughs> that would be my advice. So you're saying that it didn't go over perfectly. It did not go over perfectly, no. Yeah, when Batman said you're an orphan uh, to Robin, obviously, who's a character, who, you know, we've developed the movie more since then, but Robin was clearly a standout character that people loved. Uh, when, when Batman says that, when you're, you know, as a way to get him to leave. Because I wanted to be like one of those, like, you know, uh, you know, the, the, you know, yeah, the, 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 I can't remember what the white fang. Where it's just sort of like you know, go, go away. You know, he's trying really hard to make, yeah, to make it, make the scuttler go, and he has to say something kind of mean to make him go. So, uh, but that was deemed too far. I think we only have time for a few more questions, so just want to factor that in. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, you you know, that's a struggle for us on these movies is how much of that do you do? You know, it's, 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 it worked great in the first movie, but, you know, when you're expecting that, you know, how, you know, how, how much do you kind of like play with that world? Personally, for me, I wanted to make a movie that was kind of about Batman and just dealt with Batman's world, and there really wasn't a great real-world analog for that story that you didn't have to sort of explain something else and become another you know another movie and in a way that's kind of what we had to do in the first Lego movie you sort of have to you sort of have to do the present of business in Emmett's story kind of twice because you're dealing with Finn and his dad for a second there so the storytelling kind of it turns into a sort of a little bit of a loop um, and we had enough characters in this movie and enough things we were just trying to get in and trying to keep the running time down and and keep it as funny and as you know fast paced as we possibly. You guys kind of referenced in the movie that this was a build. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think for us, it's sort of like you know, hopefully, when the other movies, when we sort of expand more of the universe and the storytelling, that some of that's going to come out in other things. But for this movie, it felt like we didn't need it. No one was really. You know, no one was no one was totally like asking for. It. They're asking for a little bit more Lego or a little bit more of this because I, I you know, almost straight ahead made a Batman movie and Batman action movie with jokes. And I really did make, you know, Jerry Maguire about a boy as directed by Michael Mann with jokes in it. Um, and but I think you know like that you know that think that flavor that just that you didn't necessarily need it. And so we debated a lot. I yeah. mean, we um, often decided we wanted to make a standalone movie. And not try to copy ourselves from the first movie, but it's certainly a big uh, sort of source of discussion. Like even when we're talking about the base plates in the world breaking apart, what you see underneath, you know, do you actually see dirty laundry or not? And so we said not to show it visually, but we we talked about it a lot. Yeah, like how much how much you weight the them in the movie? Is that is that what you're saying? Not really a question of weight, but it's kind of a surprise to see the like Voldemort and King Kong come in. Like that just came out of nowhere. Yeah, yeah. And it was kind of cool, but at the same time, like some of us wanted to see more of the Rose Gallery. Yeah. It was cool at the end to have them featured also, but could you talk about the idea of how that came about uh, using the non Batman properties? Yeah, I really wish we had more Rose Gallery. Ultimately, that would be my, you know, if we had a little, you know, originally this movie was supposed to come out in May, um, but we needed to kind of move the release date up after we sort of flipped some releases with Ninjago and that kind of thing. So I would have loved to have found a way to get more Rogues Gallery into this movie because that's probably the one thing that I would do, you know, if I had a little bit more time, I would spend more time just trying to get more Rogues Gallery because I think there's something. <laughs> Boy, Suicide Squad, the, the Rose Gallery Suicide Squad movie. Sequel. Oh. But yeah, but that's, but, um, but, you know, bringing those guys in, you need a Joker to up his game, and that was a fun way to do it, and kind of a fun, you know, kind of, you know, mashup of all of these universes and, and that kind of thing. But, 
um, yeah, it would have been a blast to like play with all of their powers because we had bits and things that that we wanted to do with with all of them. You know, gentleman ghost and mime. Uh, I think we realized we're never gonna make everyone happy. Some people want more of like what we call the uber villains. Some want more of the rogues gallery. What we wanted the movie to reflect is the Lego play experience, which is you just don't play in one universe, you mix the universes together. And so that's why we brought in the villains from other worlds. Yeah, I, I really have to say that I, I'm hoping that, if, assuming this is a huge hit, that uh, you can do Justice League or something where you can put Batman with a whole bunch of people. Yeah. I mean, there's so many possibilities. Patchy Cheese, <laughs> El Dorado. <laughs> <laughs> Right? That's, that's so exactly what you're thinking. There's so many, there's so many choices of where to go, but it's just like the, the superhero universe. You can do something with Lego uh, that you can't do in the live action movies. You yeah. can break tone. You can break yeah. the fourth. You can do just so much. Yeah. Well, and I actually really, do, I mean, this, the Super Friends characters I actually really legitimately love those characters. I think <laughs> like there's something really fun about having all of those, like the old school ones, one. like like I said, a Patchy Chief and you know a Samurai and like all those guys like show up and. and that would be a, a lot of fun. And with the rest of the ones that everyone knows. Cool. Uh, we're, uh, do we have any other questions? No, hardly. We, we have, we'll have there and there, and we're going to call it after that. Well, there are so many incredible Easter egg movies that you have died, and a lot of them are really kind of flaky. So I was wondering, is there any little flakiness that you guys really love that are in your uh, Sienna section? Sure. The Jim um, Connor reference. Which one? The Jim Connor reference. The Jim Connor reference? Yeah. When 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 uh, Robin talks about knowing Jim Connor. Jim, oh, I Jim Cotta. Jim Cotta. I, yes. I thought yeah. of. Yes. You're a guy who was trolling the 25 cent rental bin on a Tuesday night. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. The, the Jim Jim Cotta is the uh, Kurt the, the movie that starred Kurt Thomas uh, from the 80s, who was a real life Olympic gymnast, yeah, awesome. and they made sort of the director of Enter the Dragon made a movie with Kurt Thomas that was basically Enter the, gym, Enter the Dragon with Gymnastics. <laughs> um, so bad. It's really so bad. bad. And that's, yeah, so we referenced Jim Cotta. Um, uh, <laughs> and a pommel could, horse. You, and, you, well, and, I, and we put a pommel horse yeah, on, on, on the like scuttler so he could use the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, that's what's great about the movie, there's a pommel horse every like 25 feet. Because there's always like a pommel horse with like parallel bars. Um, <laughs> So that you can really, honestly, you really do have to see that movie. Um, or shout outs to Passenger Fifty Seven. Uh, always, always bet on black. Um, yeah, stuff like that. I mean, I, I, I loved obviously the ability to be able to do that. You need some Fraggle Rock references in the next one. Maybe. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Were there any like single? Because I thought it was like a movie marquee. Uh, yeah. With some stuff on it. So were there any like single frames that you really need to be on Blu-ray? Any. And, like, yeah, anytime you're in the in the downtown area, you really have to stop on everything because there's a ton of DC lore references, you know, Falcone construction and all of that kind of thing. Um, and then there's Ferris Airlines. Ferris, <laughs> Ferris, yes, yep. yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Iceberg Lounge, all of that kind of thing. Um, and then there's also stuff that's movie references, uh, like uh, Ninjago Town, but in the Chinatown. Uh, it's literally a Chinatown poster, but it's Ninjago Town. With the, it's, there's, there's uh, on the marquee, was it Fifty Shades of Blue? What? Fifty Shades of Blay. Oh. <laughs> yeah. it, it went real fast. Yeah, like, yeah, I could yeah, not, yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a deep dive if you want to go for it. Uh, we have one more. Well, you, you already asked. Let's go right here, and we're going to call it, because I think that it has been... <laughs> Hit our limit. <laughs> I could just yell it. It's fine. <laughs> hey, what, what is it? That was incredible. You guys did an amazing job. Uh, for the kids in here, Iron Man does not suck. Sorry. Right. <laughs> 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 not bringing in Marvel, but with the licenses that you have to juggle with these kind of things, you got away with that. I wouldn't even call it a dig. It's more like a shout out. Can you possibly integrate Marvel into this whole universe? This is more of a question for the producer, I suppose. It would be the dream. Yeah. We dream of doing uh, DC versus Marvel in Lego. Yeah. <laughs> 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 one day. Um, but that would be the dream. Yeah. And I think that was our, that was our toe in the water. Yeah. Because we had to, because we literally had to run, you know, we had to ask everybody if, yeah. if they were cool with it. So. Yeah, like, are you really getting away with this? Yeah. <laughs> Every time we make these movies, like, we, can't, we can't believe we're getting away with some yeah. of this. Stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly.
Exactly. I, I, I know we were supposed to end right there, but I have to do a follow up. I mean, have you guys actually brainstormed ideas for DC versus Marvel? Because to me, that is like, holy F. You know? <laughs> it is for us, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be a fun one. No, if we were at the right, we, had, we have a lot of ideas. You know, Tim yeah. Kay, you know, loved that world, Chris and Phil, um, you know, it would be a dream for all of us to, to do it together. Yeah. yeah, I'm just thinking about all the IP that uh, is right for, Yeah. <laughs> it's just crazy. We need a mountain of lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Lovely. Uh, on that note, I'm gonna say thank you so much for doing the Q&A. And thank you for letting us do this. And if you, Thanks, see, IMAX. if you can see this movie in IMAX, you really want to see it in IMAX. Thank you, Warner Brothers, for uh, letting us show this. And seriously, congratulations on this. I hope it's a huge hit. I really do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And also,